Locked and loaded. We're back. Podcast commenced. Never better than before. Thank you for making time to do this. Thank you for being here. Having me back on. My first question. Yes. What is, is there a difference or an incongruence between what people say they desire and what they in fact desire and the outcomes that end up manifesting through like some of the, uh, something that I, I can see is sometimes like I say, I want a certain thing, but I observe <clears throat> my behavior doesn't actually exhibit the things that I say Yeah. or where I spend my money isn't exactly investing in the direction that I say right. I would like to go or where I spend my time. Mm -hmm. What is happening there? It's a great question. Humans are notoriously unreliable. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. It's pretty fascinating, isn't it? Uh -huh. Even for someone like yourself as committed and disciplined as I would argue you are, and I'm sure that you would assert the same, that you can see that discrepancy, like mm -hmm. what feels like a commitment, especially in the realm of health, wellness, vitality, longevity, that you might sort of have a pull towards that your actions aren't always commensurate with that. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating. So I would assert that what's actually transpiring the mechanisms is that there's like many aspects of being human, there's layers to what we would call in this case desire or wanting, the energy of wanting. It's multifaceted. But for simplicity's sake, we could say that there's two primary forms of wanting. Mm. That which I would assert is innate. It's primal. Um, primal might not be the right word because primal would tend generally associated with the human organism. So that, that is more in the realm of survival, right? So that wanting, I would say, is much more reactive in its quality. Reactive meaning it's in association with, in relationship to our environment. So that form of wanting tends to be focused on making it, mm. right? So say we're at a bar, very simple everyday example, or at a restaurant, and the waiter, waitress is taking our order, and let's say for very tangible, relatable, everyday case studies, it's a guy and a guy on a first date. Yeah. And let's say the girl says, I'd like a glass of, you know, Merlot. She has a glass of wine. Now, typically what the real wanting of the male would be, could be, is that he's committed to his health. Maybe he has a history of a little bit of drinking too much. Perhaps his dad, brother was an alcoholic. There's some trauma associated with it. So deep inherently, he knows that he doesn't want to drink. He doesn't typically drink but he's on a first date. So the primal wanting in that case, which is more to mate, to commune, to connect, to be loved and accepted, the wanting might get trumped, his inherent, you know, we could say his more creative choice of wanting gets superseded by the reactive wanting of like, I don't wanna look bad and I'm much more interested in finding some sort of common ground. So he says, oh, I'll have a glass of, oh, that sounds nice. Or I have a glass of Shiraz. Yeah. So that would be a fear-based wanting, which is more the reactive, which again, I'm gonna assert most people function from that form of desire, hmm. which if we really break it down to its primal components, it's really the fundamental, perhaps most primal desire of a human being, which is to be loved and accepted. Hmm. Yeah. So it seems like it's like coming into honesty and authenticity in relation to those more carnal parts of ourselves mm -hmm. could be a thing. Yeah. But then we're uh, overlaid with modernity and there's a lot of like sublimated kind of iterations of those carnal desires that come out in different expressions. Yeah. But at the root, it's, one of the like what would the carnal desires be i mean that's just a thing i'm a term i'm making up right now but like what what, what do we like those primal human instinctual yeah, yeah. sex food love yeah like, safety 
security. Absolutely, like those hierarchy of needs, right? Like, you know, once that's taken care of, then you can start to tap into those more subtler desires of companionship, family. Mm -hmm. But really, it's sort of safety to begin with shelter and then like literally some sort of survival instincts of food, water. Mm. That's why nature is so <clears throat> helpful for people. It's so honest. Mm -hmm. I just did a podcast with Laird Hamilton like a few, oh, yeah. a few days ago in uh -huh. um, Malibu. Okay. And that was one of the things we talked about is the consistency of <clears throat> nature. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So he's doing this, you know, extreme, heavy, crazy, ridiculous yeah. feats. And he trusts it more than the irrationality and unpredictability of a human being. Yeah. You know, because it's like that it's like we're like humans are they're a little spastic. As I said, notoriously unreliable. <laughs> Why yeah. is that? I asked him this question as well. Yeah. If humans are congruent with nature, like they're, they're like like they're a continuation of nature, what is it about humans that are so darn seemingly irrational? Or is there even such a thing as irrationality? For sure. And I think it's sort of bedfellow words with unreliability, irregularity, inconsistency, whatever word you want to use, right? So I think that speaks to the fact that this particular paradigm, the organism that we are, the mind-body complex that we become misidentified with is designed to survive, mm. right? The brain is wired to predict and protect with the undercurrent of like, I just hope I survive, I make it. Now, that's deep in the DNA, right? Because you leave the cave with the fire and the comfort and the family to go and forage, get food, hunt. And in those days, there was a predictable, possible, loss of life, right? That I might not survive, I might not come back. Yeah. So that's the real primal survival instinct. Today, it's like I had a couple too many pops at the golf course and I told my wife I'd be back for dinner at 6.30 and it's already seven and it's now the primal desire is like, fuck. What the hell is a pop? A pop, a beer, a beverage. Oh, you can't, I thought that was a like Canadian for soda. Of the soda pop, that's true, but in maybe in British Britain? vernacular, it's like a pop, a no, beverage, a libation, uh, <laughs> a beverage. Uh, oh, go on. Sorry. Yeah. So anyway, so the point being in that particular scenario, the fear isn't for like literal life or death. Yeah. It's that I'm going to get chewed out by my husband, my wife, my partner for being late. Right. And so then it becomes more what I would consider the survival instincts today are much more emotional, psychological, right? They're not literal. Yeah. Um, so one of my, you know, I write in quotes, as you know, and I say, if it's not life threatening, it's just ego threatening. Yeah. And so I think, wow, we live in a society that is just perpetually ego threatened. Is there any, as I was, as I was saying, the unpredictability rationality thing, is there anything that a human does that actually, if you understand that individual and their past and, you know, their ancestry and just their environmental conditions and all the things that actually is unpredictable or irrational or is everything actually a perfect expression of where they're who they are at that point like it could everything could be perfectly predicted there is nothing that's irrational nothing that's unpredictable i don't think it can be predicted because even the individual themselves is oblivious to the subconscious constraints limitations right the blind spots in lay terms yeah. so i don't think it can be predicted it however can be with sufficient listening and awareness explained hmm right? Subtle difference. So you can't even, based on your first question, you likely can't even predict your own behavior, right? Because mm. you're like, well, I know that I want to do this, or why am I spending money on this? Or why am I choosing this action? When in fact, my conscious mind is saying that I want to have this particular objective achieved. But I know intellectually that what I'm currently doing isn't in keeping with that objective. Yeah. Right? So someone's like, oh, I want to lose weight. Yet, they're checking the fridge every 10 minutes and they know that the food that's in there isn't in keeping with, commensurate with their objective. Yeah. So that's where the lack of predictability comes in. But for me, with my work, if you go down to the subconscious narratives and the programs and dialogues that somebody's literally coded by, then the behavior becomes completely explainable. So how does a person start to tap in like under the hood of their subconscious or their, their, their behavioral, behavioral patterns? and start to be able to take some empowerment with themselves, over themselves, within themselves? Yeah. What's the process with that? Well, by starting with what we're sort of touching on, which is beautiful, which is noticing the delta, the differential between what I say I want to do and what I'm actually doing. Yeah. 
right? So where there's not synergy with that, I would equate power to being equivalent to, most people misunderstand it as someone in a position of authority, or but power to me really speaks to those more esoteric conversations of like the magic of what it is to be a human where we actually align with our words. Like if you really break it down to its most fundamental principles, I'm taking hot air by virtue of having a vocal box, a vocal cord, I'm able to translate that into sound, which is really an extension of vibration, but in a language that you understand. And so if that sound is then commensurate and in keeping with the actions that I take to achieve the objective that I said I would, I literally took hot air and manifested it into reality. Hmm. That's magic hmm. to me. Yeah, it's like casting a spell, spelling a word. Spelling abracadabra as I speak, so I create, right? That's a Hebrew translation, like magic. Yeah. So that to me is equivalent to it's, it's sort of the formulation of what power equates to, hmm. right? If someone says, if you see a friend who's like, oh yeah, I'm gonna start a business, lose weight, build a house, and then you see them six months later and none of that has transpired, as a loving, kind friend, you don't judge them, but you don't equally think that's someone you want to go to with your own objectives. They don't, you know, they don't sort of add up to somebody that you would feel like, oh wow, they're a mover and shaker. They get they get shit done. Yeah. So like, how many people do that? Again, with all the compassion in the world, because that's the delta to go back to your question of like, well, I said I wanted to do something, but I'm not doing it. That warrants investigation, as far as I'm concerned. If you want to be a powerful human being who's really up to something in life. Yeah. I wonder what is poverty in culture? Is poverty just <clears throat> a, it's like a part of the institution? Like could, could everyone act from your perspective live in a comfortable way within you know, American culture for, for as a sample set or no. as homelessness and things of the sort. Is that like baked into the, to the system? It's not baked into the system. And it's is there baked in people can do, you know, it's there's like it's, a lot people can do, but doing, you have to understand like the, the cascade of how things manifest in life. Doing as an action is laid it down the chain of creation. Hmm. Doing is a byproduct of really the combination of thoughts and feelings, right? Most people are driven by emotion. Like think about, again, to go to this delta, like someone says, I want to get in shape. That could be the objective that they're declaring, they're spelling, using the power of their own voice. But then they wake up in the morning, you know, ah, fuck it, I don't feel like going to the gym. So now their emotions and how they feel have superseded what they declared they wanted to accomplish. So now that's a form of failure, which then becomes a vicious cycle, right? Because the reason that perhaps someone is out of shape is they don't have a sense of self-worth, much of which is tied into the fact that they don't do what they say they're going to do. And so that sort of cascade of trials and tribulations, failures that have occurred over time, build the subconscious narrative as something like, I'm useless, I'm hopeless, I'm not worth anything which then gives a heaviness in the body. So now it becomes a visceral experience of depression, heaviness, lethargy, apathy, which is the generator of the feeling of like, ah, I'm not gonna go to the gym today. And so it becomes a vicious cycle fulfilling on, yeah. ironically, not the words that were declared, but the deeper words, the deeper, it's still language, just in the subconscious of what's the point? I'm a failure anyway. Yeah. So, so that's the ultimate form of prediction or what we could say you can rely on humans for, is to be right about their own deep subconscious narratives. Yeah. That's where it becomes insidious. Yeah. I've heard you mention that it's very interesting. You mentioned yeah. it just recently. Was, they, how do you say it? There's a difference between the words you say and the words you are. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, so that? there's a you that you are for yourself, right? So people get caught up in the idea of, especially when they're in these type of conversations, they're working on themselves like, oh, you know, overcoming, limiting beliefs, right? Somebody might say something like that, which yeah. totally justifiable as an expression, just not quite sufficiently accurate as far as I'm concerned. Mm. I would assert the beliefs belong to the person that you are for yourself. So there's another level of code, there's another level of language. So there's a this I that is sort of synonymous with who we think we are, like I do this and I don't wanna do that and I feel like this and I there's this consistent conversation around an I. Mm. For me, at least in my work, that I has got certain attributes, qualities based in language. And then that I has the beliefs, the I has the thoughts, the I has the motions, and then the I takes 
actions and behaviors that lead to outcomes. Mm. So my investigation, what I'm interested in is like really breaking down the, you know, what is the makeup of this I that you are for yourself? Mm. Right? Because like, that's when people get, wow. And like, because if there's a you that you are for yourself that's there, and then you're aware of the beliefs you have, the emotions you experience, the actions that you take and the results that you get, all of which is a cascade in terms of the process of creation. But you're, most people focus on doing something different, right? If you go to an expert, spiritual teacher, psychiatrist, psychologist, a, a coach, it's like, well, do this, do, do something else, don't, and don't do that. Like, yeah. well, don't smoke, don't drink. But it's too late because those actions are already in keeping with as an extension of inextricably connected to the I that you are for yourself. Hmm. So in order to change outcome, you have to change behavior. That's pretty simple. But to change behavior, you have to change feelings and thoughts, intentions, and maybe beliefs. But then you have to change, well, who are you that you have all of that in the first place? Mm. So for, I love all of that. And, yeah. and so <clears throat> down to brass tacks, I'm a person that, I don't know that I would say I struggle with, but we'll just say I, I do. I struggle yeah. with addiction to it just slips around it's very slippery it'll okay. shift from one thing to another thing got it right now we're on nicotine okay what the fuck right <laughs> <laughs> and and what do I do, man? and healing yeah. <laughs> okay so so it's beautiful and I've, i'm glad that you're you know we've never had this conversation i didn't know that was something you dealt yeah. with so i appreciate the honesty and vulnerability yeah. so yeah an addiction i've got more <laughs> don't, don't worry. Okay. How long have you got? So, <laughs> so addiction is an interesting phenomenon, right? Because I would assert that the actual I that we are for ourselves is the ultimate addiction, right? So yeah. in this case, nicotine for someone else could be food, alcohol, weed, sex, pick your poison, right? So the substances is where a lot of people get caught. Like I'm addicted to cocaine. I'm addicted to heroin. I'm addicted to nicotine. Not inaccurate, but insufficient, right? Because we have to understand, well, who is the you that has the addiction, mm. right? That's the ultimate addiction. So I would assert that every human being fundamentally is addicted. They may not have the, it may not manifest in the substance, but they're addicted to these subconscious ideas of themselves, mm. right? And then that will play out. Like for someone, it could be they're addicted to self-sabotage. They would never declare that. Like you said, I'm addicted to nicotine. It's not like, oh, like I'm addicted to absolutely ruining my life and any good possible outcome. Or I'm addicted to like ending any really beautiful relationship. You know, mm. It's not actually declared as such as a statement, but that's what's transpiring in their life. I've declared that. Yeah. yeah. I'm addicted to making a lot of money and then losing it. Like, mm. <laughs> but it's nonetheless a cycle that to me speaks to this deep, fundamental addiction that is the idea of ourself, right? So if we look at Aaron as this sort of I, as the placeholder based on a sound and a name that you were given at a young age, as a continuation of that idea, at least just from my perspective, the ultimate addiction is that idea of oneself, right? That is the, at the core of all the thoughts, feelings, actions, outcomes. Mm -hmm. So in this case, nicotine is your current, you know, choice de jour, right? Like it could slip into other, and that's what happens, right? Somebody who might say that they're now sober because they had a drinking issue or they were addicted to alcohol is now, you know, really keen working out and they go to the gym every day, but mm -hmm. unbeknownst to them, it's still another form of addiction. It's just manifested. Right? Yes. So in order for us to really get to why that transpires or occurs, we have to employ a lot of love and compassion. Right. So mm -hmm. what I hear and even you sharing for the first time with me, the story of an addiction in this case to nicotine, what I hear beneath all of it is judgment. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's usually at the core of most addictions is there's some sort of resistance, which is self-loathing is a strong word or a strong expression, but it's where there's a feeling of there's quote unquote something wrong with me. There's a judgment of the behavior itself. Right. Yeah. yeah. Now, if we look at the inner judgment, it's actually a form of resistance, right? You're at some level denying yourself. It's judgment, we could say, is sort of the antithesis of love and acceptance, right? You judge someone, you criticize someone. You're not saying that I love and accept you for who you are. You're saying there's something wrong with you. You're bad. You shouldn't do that. So if we look at the language of parents to children, 
invariably that's sort of in everyday conversation. Don't do this, Johnny, stop. Like, stop hitting your sister. That's bad. That's yeah. what, right? It's such an intrinsic part of the conditioning of the human mind. It's almost like you contract them in that state with the judgment. <clears throat> yeah, what we hear is from that perspective is, because if you really go back to a very young age before language, and this is why I love language, because in the absence of language, a baby will throw up on the aunt that's so excited to meet the baby who's three months old. Oh my God, like it's my little niece or nephew. And, but the baby will throw up just by virtue of the biological needs, the physiological, whatever's happening, a little toxicity, bloating, too much breast milk. I don't know what transpired, but the body's doing its job, which is I've got to get rid of this at the clearest exit point, which is my mouth. The baby doesn't go, oh shit. That's my aunt. It's the first time I'm meeting her. That's a bad impression. Mm. Not only that, she's wearing her favorite Gucci outfit. Yeah. <laughs> right? That would all be the psychological form of like ego threatening. It's just the biology, which is beautiful. Once we actually start to then incorporate language and understand words, which is the eye that we offer ourselves is the fundamental, most deep programming. Now it's like, oh, that was bad. So if, if the same kid did that at five, and peed its pants in front of its aunt, now you've got shame, embarrassment, guilt, because you can understand, what are you doing? What's wrong with you, right? The three-month-old, the six-month-old, there's no comprehension. So there's no feeling of guilt or shame. Yeah. So for you, my friend, in your own personal declaration of what you just kindly, generously, vulnerably shared, the addiction is ultimately not to nicotine, but it will be to some deep feeling of self-judgment. Yeah, for sure. That makes sense. That's why it's it's slippery and shifts around. Yeah, because it's, it's as long like, as it's the several different things, and I'll be like, oh, cool, like nailed that, and then another thing will pop up, and it's almost like there's some part of me that desires to maintain. You could call it self judgment or some obstacle or some yeah, you know, self sabotage or like whatever the thing is. It just it's yeah. like almost like I, like I like something to gnaw on. Yeah, you know. And the I that's even saying that. Well, I don't know what I is necessarily. Right. Right. So but, some version of I likes something to gnaw on. Yes. And, I, and, and some version of I doesn't know <clears throat> what some version I would do if I didn't have something to gnaw on. Right. Because that I that you are for yourself, this is really getting down now to this like bone marrow level of narrative, is, is based in some form of inadequacy, insecurity, self-judgment, right? So the judgment energy... If you were to put it in basic lay terms, the fact that you currently addicted to nicotine, sometimes it might morph into something else. What is the undercurrent for the you in terms of Aaron's view of himself with that behavior? What would be the way that you would describe yourself or all that? In the, in the, in the moment of like <coughs> reaching out for the nicotine? Yeah, as an or example, actually or? having that as a behavioral pattern of addiction itself. Mm. Like if you were to describe both the behavior and who you are because of the behavior, how would you mm. describe it? Feels weak. Weak, great. That's a judgment, right? Like, mm. yeah, that's awesome. That's yeah. I felt that. <laughs> that hit, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now feel that. So it's not it's weak. Now put it in the first person. I am weak. Yeah. What does that feel like? Hmm. There's some truth there. I, I feel like there's more. There's more than just I am weak. Yeah. Um, For sure. Yeah. Maybe I am. I am dependent. That's wouldn't be the language that a child would use. That's yeah. the adult rationalization or explanation. Once you get into the mental aspects of using fancier words, mm. you're away from the feeling. Uh, like yeah, when right, you right. said I'm weak, it's, it's like, like words, you can see like the little boy who feels weak, right? Yeah. 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 I feel like the, there's something about like that reoccurring <clears throat> being like, you know, I'll tell myself, uh, this is the last time I, I do a nicotine thing. Yeah. And then freaking three hours later, I'm like, I'm like reaching out to it. Yeah. And I'm just like, God, I'm fucking weak. Perfect. Bro. So this is the last time I'm doing a nicotine thing or whatever the particular substance du jour is. Yeah. What is, what is the subtext to that statement? What are you saying about going for nicotine? Uh, I'm, I'm saying I don't, I don't trust myself. I'm, I, 
disrespect myself. For sure, there are explanations, but like in in the declaration of like this is the last one I'm having. Mm. What are you implying about the having of it? That I don't want to have it anymore because it doesn't make me feel good. Right, but there's if you stay in the realm of judgment, right? I'm weak. Mm. You could feel that. Like everyone, I could feel that with you. You could feel that, right?、Mm-hmm. Like it's a it's a self stabbing with words, right? Yeah. But this is the last nicotine I'm going to have. There's a subtext to that statement because it's implying something about having.、Uh, ni- I am powerful. Well, no, that's the antithesis, right? But in in the this is the last <clears throat> time I'm doing it. Like that's my that's my statement of. Yeah,、power. but it's zero power in it. That's the irony.、Mm. That's why it doesn't work. That's why three hours later, there's no power there. That's actually pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Right, <laughs> said with all due love and compassion. <laughs> <That is. Yeah. laughs> Thank you so much. Please, may I have another? <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, no. So if so, you're close, but this is why it's a blind spot because the eye that you offer yourself, you can't see, right? Because you are that. So in saying this is the last piece of nicotine I'm going to have, there is an implicit understanding in your relationship to that behavior, and it's in the realm of judgment. So, for example, let's go the other way.、Yeah. When you go to have the most beautiful organic strawberry that you know is grown with love, would you say this is the last strawberry I'm going to have? No. No. Why? It's good. Good stuff. Makes me healthy. Makes me strong. Great. So now let's go to the other one. This is the last piece of nicotine I'm going to have. What's implicit in that statement? Makes me weak. Makes Doesn't me- make you weak. It's subtler. What is? What would you declare about that behavior if you saw someone doing that? Would you say that was a good choice? No. No. So what is it? Incompetent. Okay. I don't know many three, five-year-olds <laughs> going to say I'm so incompetent for my inability to stop this addiction to sugar <laughs> to tap into my inner child. Yeah. <clears throat> It's so fundamental、what. and so subtle. When you're there, like, so when was the last time you had a piece of nicotine?、Uh, four hours ago. Okay. Great. And when was the last time prior to that that you said this is the last time I'm going to have a piece of nicotine? Maybe four days ago. Okay. Or so. And then during the full course of the four days, you've、That's、had before、multiple. this trip to Tahoe, or like we're not going to do it. And then not going like, to do well, it. Stop it. Yeah. So in the declaration, I'm not going to do it. There's something implied about how you feel about doing that. I don't know. Tell me. Well, help, help it's me, more important for you to feel it, right? So I, the strawberry, good. What's the antithesis of good? Bad. Right. Can you feel into that? That maybe the reason that the I that Aaron is says this is the last time I'm going to do that is because there's a subtext that what I'm doing is bad for me. Oh yeah, I like to be like a bad boy. A for sure, but that's what we got to get to, right? <laughs> yeah, I like. I prefer to be bad.、There's、you don't. Some, there's some. Well, It's not a choice. It's based on your conditioning. That's the subtlety here. The I that says I prefer to be bad, all that is is a justification of your own identity, but at great cost because, as we've seen, there's a there's a tug of war within yourself.、Mm. The part of you that enjoys being bad is when you fall into your identity. Yeah. But the part of you that beneath that is committed to what I would say are the real inherent things that we want. To go back to the very first question of wanting. Yeah. Is freedom? Is peace? Is love? Is vitality? Things that I would qualify as the essence of our soul, our spirit,、yeah. the real I, beyond the identity of I, right? So the wanting of、oh, I want to be bad, I I get it based on how you see yourself. Well, it's not that I want to be bad. I just notice in my behavior that I I trend towards、um, you know pushing against authority and anything that's authoritative. My tendency is is just by default to go the other right. direction. Right, and you even have that relationship with yourself with because you declare I don't want to do this, and then you're like, well, fuck that. I'm going to do whatever the fuck I want. Right. Yeah. So there's a degree of that that conflict within yourself. Totally. But that's also, without knowing anything about your childhood, have stemmed from some dynamic you established, likely with your father. Oh yeah, right.、Mm. Which is that you were the quote unquote byproduct of the judgment from him, not his fault. You incarnated with this program. He was simply the catalyst to turn it on, which、I、gets feel, a little deeper. Now, I feel like the judgment with my father would probably be more judgment on himself <laughs> that we passed. 
through and then also a lack of stability or presence of him and kind of like a quote unquote, like for, for the boy version of myself, like a losing of him. He went to jail. He got really into drugs. It was a whole thing. Right. And so my experience with that of working of like acknowledging that I have some like refathering to do within myself, um, is kind of a lack of that structure within myself. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. But that's the adult, very cerebral front, prefrontal cortex oh, yeah. explanation. Yeah. As a little boy with all the things that you heard and saw him going to jail, drugs, and the more than anything, what I hear is the reprimanding. And I'm not saying he was at all violent or he hit you. I don't know. Yeah. But there's something in, I want you to feel into that feeling. Again, we'll come back to the case study of I'm addicted to nicotine is sure. the access point, right? That's the external, the exogenous manifestation of this internal narrative. So I'm addicted to nicotine, I'm not gonna do that. Subtext of that statement, which is the wanting, because you know it's bad, is really, I don't wanna do it because it's bad. Hmm. But now if we personify that, how, how would it go from it's bad to- I'm bad. I'm bad. Yeah. I'm bad for doing it. Yeah. And so now you've got this sort of devil angel conversation of like, I'm bad, which is the precursor to craving the nicotine. That's the ultimate addiction. And then you've got the more mature, evolved version of you, which is powerless relative to the subconscious version of you, but it's a good conversation. It makes it, oh, I don't want to do that. This is the last one I'm going to do. Yeah. Okay, that pales in comparison to the subconscious manifestation of how you've identified yourself. Yeah. So what's it like to live in the world of I'm bad as how you see yourself. Now you're not walking around going, hi, I'm Aaron, I'm bad, mm -hmm. right? But there's this sort of, you know, there's this dirty secret, right? I didn't know that, I feel pretty close to you. I didn't know you had an addiction to nicotine. Mm. It's not something you talk about. Yeah. Why wouldn't you talk about it? Well, because it's where you have guilt and shame. Mm. Guilt and shame closely associated with the dialogue, the narrative of I'm bad, Yeah. right? They're commensurate. So why would I talk about that? I'm going to talk about the good stuff. I look great. I'm, my body work, who I work with, like, you know, we, we promote. I try, I try to pepper in the, um, I'm like, you know, a dumpster fire as well as the best I can. <clears throat> yeah. And that happens obviously with your more intimate relationships and people who get to know you. We, yeah. you know, as well as I know you and love you, I don't spend that much time with you. Right. So I don't yeah. know these intimate details, but nonetheless, you can see that it's contaminated with the energy of judgment. Judgment's a thing. Right. Yeah. yeah. And the judgment is the feeling, the experience that the kid has based on the narrative that I would assert you arrive with, which is a much more esoteric conversation, that you, you came into this lifetime to transcend the story that who you are is bad. Yeah. And this is just one of the, way, one of the ways it manifests. Yeah. The other way we could say is sort of the, the good bedfellow of bad is like, oh, I like to be the bad boy. So like it kind of gets me off, right? Because mm. that's where the ego gets to be right about its own idea of itself. Yeah. But there's going to be costs there, right? Whether it's nicotine and the impact on your body. Oh, that's interesting. The way that it shows up in the fact that you might berate yourself, you berate other people around you, less likely. Yeah. Relationships that don't work, perhaps as a loving guy that I know you to be, but if you're a bad guy, what does that look like in a relationship sometimes, mm -hmm. right? Is it dismissive? Is it abusive? I don't see you that way. but you know, they can manifest like that, right? Yeah. So now we start to go to the real core of an addiction. Nicotine is simply the byproduct. But underneath it, we get the gold of like, oh, I don't want to do nicotine. Why don't I want to do it? Because it's bad. Not it's bad. It's bad is an extension of how I see myself. Yeah. Now, when you live in the world of I'm bad, how does that feel? Mm. Uh, dark small contracted yeah weak would be another aspect weak, that we touched yeah. on before right yeah yeah so now i want you to consider that energetic manifestation of dark heavy lethargic it's isolating too right like i'm separate from i'm bad i'm i'm a i don't fit in yeah those energies create suffering i feel emotion coming up right now yeah so it's like the the not fitting in part's definitely a, a thing yeah uh, and i can see that I can see that in the way that you behave. Mm. Like, you know, as subtle as it is, it's beautiful in the attempts, social media, the way you present, right? Like there's an effort there that's exhausting, honestly, mm. when you really see it, mm. where you're wanting desperately to fit in, but that energy that doesn't feel that it does is the precursor to the attempt to 
So it becomes a vicious cycle, hmm. right? So can you remember one moment, if there's going to be a few, I'm sure, but where you really felt this for the first time, that you'd done something wrong and bad? <clears throat> what, was the, what was the worst thing you did as a kid where it doesn't have to be dad, but likely dad, somebody told you? Hmm. Earliest memory of being, I don't think that I had a, nothing stands out. Maybe just because it's like not, you know, I don't know, repressed or something. But yeah. there's more of an overarching sensation of feeling like disconnected yeah. from uh, people. Yeah, okay. You know, so like in school, feeling very disconnected, just feeling like everyone else, like in my experience, which maybe everyone else felt that way too, or some percentage of people felt that way too. But it seems like everyone else kind of felt like they congealed and they were like, yeah. oh yeah, like we're all, we're all good here. You know, we're friends and whatnot. Yeah. Um, family reunions, same thing. Like, like family was very much like, wow, everyone just kind of gets it. They're like, right. they're like, they're so happy. They're like, they're in their family reunion. This is, this is great. <clears throat> and I was always kind of in this like kind of observation, subtly disassociated. Yeah. Kind of like, what am I doing here? And who are these people? And you know, why do I, what do I do with my hands? Right. You know? Yeah. yeah. And so that feeling of just, I think kind of, um, not feeling like belonging. Yeah. 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 And what's that like to live in? What is it like to live in? Yeah. And that feeling like whether you're a kid, whether you're now an adult, you see friends, everyone getting along, but you don't fit in. Uh, lonely. Very lonely, right? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And when you feel lonely, how do you feel? Uh, similar characteristics, weak contracted dark yeah and i throw in sadness like you know yeah sadness is a big one for me that's a real big one that's a heavy one right hmm. like if you were to look at your heart as a little boy who's at an event where he doesn't really fit in whether it's school family reunions he feels lonely what i feel more than anything is like a really profound sadness yeah because he's a beautiful kid and he really wants to fit in right and he just doesn't know what to do to fit in. He's willing to do anything. Hmm. Which has that feeling of hopelessness with it too, right? Because you don't know what to do. I just want to be able to fit in and get along with people. Hmm. So that creates that efforting, but with the confusion of the weakness of I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Like you said, I don't know where my hands are supposed to go as an anatomical expression of that. Yeah. Yeah. For that, that's also a bit scary, right? Because like you, within that, there's an underlying narrative of I'll, I'll do anything, but I don't want to do anything wrong because I already feel isolated. Hmm. So God forbid what I do isn't accepted. Now it's like I've just doubled down on my isolation. Mm -hmm. That's scary for a kid. So how does that circle back into present day addictive behavior? And I'm saying this for people <clears throat> listening. Yeah, of to course. To try to not no, make this be too selfish about this No, experience. no, of course. Right. But everybody's got this quality. As but I this said. is interesting because like when we have these, ex these kind of topical symptomatic experiences that, that govern our lives, if you have the spaciousness and the facilitation and like the resources within yourself or community or therapist or somebody like you or whatever, to be able to sink deeper into it, I feel like like the roots typically go much deeper than just the thing at the top. And the thing at the top right. is just kind of like a flare. As I said, that's symptomatic. It's, it's a byproduct, right? Yeah. That's the access. Nicotine is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Whenever I've helped anyone with an addiction, I couldn't care less about the substance. I, right. mean, I care because I care, but I couldn't care less. That's, that is simply like at the tail end of the process that generates the desire for ultimately a coping strategy. Yeah. So if we can tap into that little boy who feels lonely, he's sad, he's confused, he's isolated, he doesn't belong. There, there's a real heaviness to that. Oh, right? yeah. Especially as a sentient, sensitive, caring, loving man that you are now. Mm. So in that energy, the overarching theme I call that is just suffering. You're suffering. It's a form of trauma. Mm -hmm. And when we suffer or we're in a state of pain, we're literally design, we're designed to find some escape, some relief, some form of soothing. Yeah. 
So you may not, as a kid, be drawn to nicotine. Maybe it was you found some value in being strong. You found some, because that's part of your identity, right? So you found some form of acceptance in your physique. You found some acceptance in your good looks. Maybe when you started to find some acceptance with a girl or sexuality or intimacy. And so when, you, when we start to discover the means by which we find relief from our suffering, that's when that addictive pathway starts to turn on. Hmm. So for you, nicotine is one way, but you've probably seen, as you said, many other ways, iterations of that. Right? Yeah. So whatever is the lowest hanging fruit at the moment that will allow you to mitigate the internal suffering is just your current addiction. Right. So how do we start to go <clears throat> deeper into those subterranean parts and start to work with the roots of the yeah the symptom being the addiction exactly what we're doing so if we can start to see that and nicotine so we have to look at it superficially so this might be a hard question it isn't a hard question but it is based on the way that you look at life the way that you relate and the way that you view life so is constantly wanting to go for a nit in this case nicotine is that and it's only a yes or no answer. Is that inherently bad? No. It's not, is it? Mm -mm. Now, I'm not denying consequences. We could replace nicotine with heroin. Yeah. That might be a harder question for answer. People are like, well, nicotine, not so heroin, that's bad. <laughs> not necessarily. It, it's not a necessary, it's a no categorically. Yeah. Because when you understand from the point of view of simply physics, it's what you're doing. Yeah, it just is. It's just what it is. Yeah. But where we and I, particularly in this conversation that I didn't know we were going to have, but it's beautiful, where I can see is like nicotine is not the issue, but oh, he just with an atel showed me there's some deep feeling of self-judgment because what you're doing is in that relationship to nicotine, you're judging it. Mm -hmm. There's no judgment inherent in taking nicotine, heroin, alcohol, whatever. It's just what you're doing. And in the realm of physics, this realm that we're in of like the manifest world, there's relativity. You're strong as an ox. If I fucking did cocaine, nicotine or whatever, I probably wouldn't last as long as you because there's the consequences of behavior. That's just physics. But that's not what's upsetting you. There's going to be some impact, right? Obviously in your physiology over time doing whatever substance. And you mitigate it a lot by your diet lifestyle. But what we're really looking at is the root cause of that behavior, which is not that nicotine is bad. I feel bad about doing it. And the lower below that is I am bad. Yeah. When I feel who I am is bad, I experience suffering, isolation, loneliness, sadness. Those are under the auspices of a discomforting feeling, suffering. When we're in suffering, we want to find relief. So from the place of I'm bad, the way that you are for yourself, the you that you are for yourself is bad, you look to escape. And whatever the, as I said, addiction, the addiction du jour is, you're going to use that. Then that becomes the vicious cycle that reinforces, oh, look, I'm doing something bad, which is the way that the ego gets to perpetually be right about itself, which is the one thing that I said humans can be, you know, reliable about <laughs> is self-righteousness. Yeah. So how, how do I, other than the observation, yeah. you know, and, and identification, what would be the active tools for a person, me in this case, but I, I presume it would be relevant for lots of people yeah. to start to maybe re-nurture that version of myself, if, if that's proper language or like yeah. to come back in and, and provide that boy with the things that he needed, if that's appropriate language. From yeah, your yeah. Perspective. No, and we're doing it right. So I'm just going very like there's a very intentional way that I'm working with you. And so like, so I'm helping you to understand because the way that you're wired is you're very vigilant. And people who have the deep code of I'm bad tend to have developed that meaning you're hyper aware, you're very sensitive, you're, you're very observant. So I, I'm taking you from external so that we can go back progressively reverse engineer into internal. So we started with, you have a thing with nicotine. Okay, great. What does that mean? And it took a while for you to understand the subtext of I do nicotine. It's like you found it, it was hard for you to get to, oh yeah, it's bad. Like, 
Why would I say, don't do it again? You don't say, you know what? Don't do some mobility exercise ever again. Because <laughs> there isn't the subtext of that's bad. That, the way that occurs to you is like, that's good for me. It enhances my vitality. So now we got to, oh, that's bad. That was good. That was, that was hard for you to get to. Then we're like, no, it's not bad. So your brain is now starting to understand what I'm taking you through is it's just doing nicotine. But it revealed your relationship to it, which is as bad. Right. Oh, okay. Now we get an, a little insight into how you relate to you. Because yeah, for somebody else right now, millions of people doing nicotine, they can give a shit. They don't have the same sensibility about their own self-worth yet. They haven't gotten to that point of evolution. They're like, fuck it, I'll do... They think nicotine's good because fuck, I used to do fucking heroin. Right. <laughs> right. They're, They're right. like, I'm fucking proud of myself, <laughs> right? Still the same behavior, but different conversation about it. So when, you start to, so when you start to see that, right? Like you get the cascade of, I don't want to do something, undercurrent is the reason I don't want to do it is because I want to be a good person and what I'm judging as that behavior is, is it bad? No, that's the way you're relating to life. The way you relate to life is really an expression of how you relate to yourself. So we've gone from addiction, bad, don't want to do it. Oh, I'm bad, holy shit. Now we can start to see different moments based on what you shared, some of which you're not accessing because it hurt too much for you to feel that you were bad, that you did something wrong would be another way that I would start to play with the language, that you were reprimanded, don't do that, Aaron, you're a bad boy. May not have been the language of I'm bad, but that was the way you interpreted any time that you got reprimanded. Could also be something that's like a lineage thing as well. For sure. Like something yeah. that I've, I've, I've pulled from my mom and my dad and yeah. their childhood. Because I yeah. think some of this stuff for me is a little pre, like pre-verbal. Yeah, where it's sure. like I'm looking for it and it's almost like it's not a word thing. It's not like an experience thing. Some things are very visual for me. Yeah. But sometimes it's just like a feeling. And so I question if perhaps that's something that I'm holding from my parents. For sure. And it's no different than like genetic inheritance, right? If there's a predisposition to cardiac arrest, right? Like we can take on that code in our DNA. So this could be emotional. So my guess is based on the, like, this is all new and tell to me, but like the fact that I didn't know your dad did drugs, he went to jail. I don't know what the story is about your mom, but I would imagine a little boy just through the realm of comparison, right? So that your dad does what he does, did what he did. But then you go to maybe your friend's house and their family seems to be like this more copiesthetic, harmonious. I don't know. Yeah, we were always, we like, I grew up on like the, like the, the old side of the neighborhood. And I was kind of like, grew, I was kind of around like the, uh, kind of like badder kids because yeah, it was exactly. like they didn't have as much money. There you go. Yeah. And that feels emotional for me as well, actually. So that's like a very like deep thing. Yeah. And so there was a sensation of feeling like almost like, uh, hmm. Yeah, just a little, yeah, I guess like, like bad in a way or like not, not slightly not as good. Yeah. You know? And yeah, you're like less than. Less than. Like you're really less than. Yeah. Aren't you? Yeah. yeah. That's, the that like? that's the feeling. Yeah. What is that like? Yeah, it feels like uh, distant, um, yeah, small, kind of distant, like small and out in the distance. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it feels emotional as well. Yeah. Yeah, you're like the misfit. Mm-hmm. The discarded member of society. The lepers, right? on the wrong side of the tracks, however, whatever words you want to use, but you can feel the energy of a little kid who naturally by virtue of being human, being a being, being sentient, wants to feel love and acceptance, wants to fit in. But your way of relating to life, and particularly in this case, your community is, oh, but I'm not that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's pretty heavy for a kid to carry, yeah. especially a kid who really wants it, really craves it. Yeah. Yeah. So no wonder that you say you go to these things, you go to events and you don't fit in because you're not one of the people that you should be. Mm -hmm. Right. You're the delinquent. That's starting to change as, as in the last race. And I'm starting, it's starting to come into, I'm not saying this in a defensive way. I'm just no, saying no, this no. in an observational way. Yeah. Um, but that's been an interesting thing of, uh, and this is part again, I'd want to, to be 
capturing directionality and you know support for other people and, and you know, so making sure that the conversation goes in that direction yeah. um, but that and so I, I, I would be potentially interested in observing some of the pieces that have come together for me to not feel that way as much although still at a deeper level there's that's there yeah. but I'm in observation of that within myself as whatever version of you know person I am now adult whatever yeah. um, of feeling significantly more for sure. Safe, confident, and at home. For sure. And, and I, I give still you that. those deep, deep parts in there. So just for your own understanding, because you're obviously tracking with what we're, what we're talking about and you've done a lot of work, what I'm doing with you, for you, is I'm really pushing you into not necessarily who you are today, but the deep code that's been there since day one. Yeah. yeah I'm not denying the linear progression that you've made, the improvements that you've made. I'm not so interested in that. You've definitely had moments where you might be the center of attraction. You might be the wealthiest person in the room. Well, I'm, I'm more, I'm, again, I'm not saying that as a look at me defensive thing. Yeah. I'm saying that more in a sense of surprise. Yeah. I was like, interesting. Like I'm seeing more time spent where I'm like, I, that sensation's not there. But then when we pull the hood back, it's like, it's yeah. still very present. Yeah, for sure. Because this is at the deepest, this is the core, right? And so for me, in terms of my work with you, again, not knowing that this was a conversation we'd be having, which is beautiful, is that there's this idea of yourself that has been ever present. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm doing is I'm helping you frame it. I'm helping you feel it. I'm helping you understand it. Because ultimately where we're going with this, like I know how the story ends, is you're going to see that's not you. It's just what's driven you, it's defined you, it's who you've been for yourself, right? So we're starting to get the uh, understanding, the characteristics, the qualities of this idea of you, the kid that didn't fit in, the kid that was from the wrong side of the tracks, that you were definitely less than, from a poorer family. Your parents weren't the best, they didn't do the best thing. So there's a degree of shame even that's inherited from them. So you've got this sort of, as you said, the inheritance of shame of your folks with no judgment of them. But then you've got the inheritance of your own karma, which is I'm, f I'm less than the society, the friends, the community that I want to be a part of. So you've got both the shame and the guilt that is inherited, but then you've also got the feeling of inadequacy of how you relate to life. Yeah. All of which comes into this tight little bundle called I'm bad, I'm weak, yeah. I don't fit in. Yeah. And in sort of more you know, poetic terms, nobody loves me, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Or not wor I'm not worthy of love. <clears throat> yeah. Like, yeah. So you get this whole mishmash and now you start to see, wow, that's the weight of the addiction. Because when you live in that world and you've done a good job of presencing, emotions naturally come up. When I've asked you to look at, you can feel the feeling of isolation, loneliness, sadness. It's all there in keeping with this identity of yourself. Yeah, it's the, the, the base of the iceberg. Yeah, that's, that's the foundation of the eye that you are for yourself until when you leave here, which is not, it might still be there. There's what I call residual self-image. So you'll be able to tap into that. Like, you know, if someone gave you enough money to play a kid who was from the wrong side of the tracks, who's the bad boy, who has a bit of an addictive behavior and tendency, like you could tap into it, but I'm not interested in you sustaining it, right? Yeah. When you leave. Yeah. So we just, but we have to become familiar with it. We have to get to know it. We want to listen. We want to be able to actually presence it. Then from there, you can go, oh, well, of course, that particular identity, that particular individual would, through the feeling of sadness, suffering, isolation, want to find some relief, right? That's not fun to hang out in this place. It's miserable. It's exhausting. So you're going to be like, okay, oh, oh, it feels good when I have nicotine. It feels good when I have sex. It feels good when I drink, if it, whatever your go-to is, right? But they are just extensions of that same collage of feelings of inadequacy and shame and guilt. Yeah. Right? So where where we so I think we've presenced enough how you feel living there, because you've you know, you've been there for three plus decades, right? You don't need to hang out there any longer. Yeah. So where were you born? Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Okay. So let's start with if I were to cut you open physically, am I going to find an actual manufacturing label made of whatever material, wood, metal? Like literally it's like, oh, this is, this, this, this is who he is. Like it's Aaron born in Pennsylvania. He's bad. Am I going to find anything like that physically inside of you? No. Not at all, right? Not at all. 
So it doesn't define you in terms of your hardware. Meanwhile, if someone could read your genome, they'd understand why you have the eye color, the particular physical stature that you have, because that's part of that code that we call DNA. It's another form of language, right? But what we're dealing with is the language above that, which is subconscious code. So that's more like you've got the hardware of how you physically present. So if it's not physical manufacturing label, where, where is the I'm bad? Where does that exist? In my mind. Right. And so in your mind, what, what is the mind made up of? In I'm bad, what, is, what does that consist of? What is its format? What is its structure? I'm bad. Mm. It's, 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 um, uh, orchestra of electricity that <laughs> manifests itself as a thought. Yeah, you could get into the real like neurochemistry and like, right? But I'm going to keep it even simpler. So I want you to consider that software, so think about a computer, like you've got the hardware, you've got the actual keyboard, you've got the, the physical memory chips and semiconductors and whatever. But like when we put software on there, what's software made up of? Like how do people write software? Made of light. Light, yeah, I mean, we could say everything is, but if, yeah. if I went to a coder to create a piece of software, what's he going to do? What's he going to use to create software? Apart from the hardware, but what? Oh, I don't know, plastic, metal? Right, that's the hardware. So programming, right? So they're going to program, and programming is language, right? They use C++ or whatever, I don't know, HTML, or whatever, whatever the, the current, you know, or I don't even know coding, right? But they're a software engineer and someone who can write code is going to help you create iTunes to Safari, browsers, whatever. So you've got the hardware, Aaron, anatomically. The I'm bad exists in your mind as a piece of software. It's a piece of code, but it's deep code. It's the code that actually is at the bottom of all the other pieces of code that you're aware of, of like, don't do the nicotine. You're aware of that. That's a conscious thought. But it's being generated from deeper code of I'm bad, feeling bad is uh, sad, I feel lonely, so I'm going to go to nicotine because that makes me feel relief. It makes me feel better. Yeah. And then you try and circumnavigate that and uh, overcome it with your conscious idea of I want to be healthy and, oh, I'm a health guy, actually, so it's probably not good that I do that. And then you've got all that extra judgment, right? Yeah. But ultimately, I'm bad exists as a piece of code, language, in your subconscious. Yeah. And it's both inherited a little bit, as you said, from folks. It's also reflective of the environment you grew up in, that you didn't fit in, you were less than. Right? And now you start to see, oh, wow. So it's not physical, it's software, and it's in language, which got adopted for all the right reasons. Like you got the justification for it. Yeah. But if that's the only evidence you have that gave rise to the deep code that who you are is bad, and it only exists literally in words, it's just got a lot of momentum because you've had it for decades, if I either ask you the question, you can only say yes or no. If it's only language, it's only software, is it a truth, an actual truth that who you are is bad? No. Not, right? But it's a role you can play, clearly. Yeah. And in fact, you sometimes enjoy being the bad boy, yeah. right? Which is the confirmation of your own identity. So in the absence, and so now we start to see, we have seen what it feels like to live as a bad person, the impact on your health the things that you do, the choices you make, the loneliness you experience. But if it's only software, it's only a piece of code, it's literally narrative, it's not a truth. So what would it feel like for Aaron, the real Aaron, to step forward in the absence, the removal, the dissolution of that I'm bad? Like, so if you couldn't relate to life as you're bad or anything you're doing is bad, and this is a, the way I phrase it, is I'm introducing you to a world that you're not necessarily familiar with. But that, imagine that's gone. Yeah. What could you feel like in the absence of that constraint? Feels uh, expansive. Yeah. Feels uh, sturdy, safe, stable. Yeah. Uh, strong, big. Isn't that beautiful? Mm. So what we're doing is we're not fixing a problem, we're revealing what was beneath the narrative that gave rise to the idea that you had a problem. Mm -hmm. So from that place of stability, strength, power, like feeling confident, can you see that you could do nicotine? I'm not saying you will, you likely won't choose those things anymore. As you shift your frequency, that won't be something you're drawn to. But can you see that even if you chose a behavior like that, 
there isn't the same subtext of judgment that you're doing something wrong. Right. Now that's cool. Because you can have the same behavior, but you have a completely different reaction or response to it. Yeah. That's power. Mm. So you're no longer a victim of circumstance. You're doing what you're doing. And then your internal narrative is what generates your experience. Mm. So in the absence of I'm bad, you feel free ultimately. Right. That was the main addiction. But then the other one that you said like really brought up some emotion for you is what we use the term of less than. You're somehow, you know, the dysfunctional human in that community. You're the lower than, less than, right? Yeah. So let's go to that. So if I were to cut you open physically, am I gonna find a physical manufacturing that says, Aaron Alexander, born in Pennsylvania, he's less than everybody else. Not at all, right? Mm -hmm. So where does the I'm less than live? In my mind. And what is its structure? What is its format? Code. Exactly. It is the language that was what was, because we're starting to dismantle it, define the you that you were for yourself. So if it's just language and it was ultimately an avatar, a role that you played, albeit for your life, so it feels very real, but if it's just language, is it a truth, an actual truth that who you are is somehow less than others? No. It's not, is it? And that's a heavy one for you if you really feel into it, which you did earlier. So in the absence of the ability, you can't even feel less than anybody else. Like it's gone. Mm. Like you don't relate to life that way at all. Like that would be an absolute aberration for you. It's gone. You can't feel less than any other human, any other being on the planet. How would that leave you feeling relative to society and in yourself? Mm, feels like uh, graceful. Right? Mm. Yeah, expand on that because I can feel that. Uh, yeah, it just it feels like more um, yeah, fluid, more ease, more grace. Yeah. Uh, what would that look like if you were in a group, a gathering, a reunion, someone who can't be less than? How do you navigate that room now? Uh, it'd be less tension in my body. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be less like, uh, yeah, just less tension. Yeah. And feel like more relaxed. And how would that manifest in relation to how you commune, communicate, and interact with people? Um, it'd be more from the heart. Yeah. yeah. More probably effortless, more authentic, more harmonious. You could talk to people or not talk to people, but you're not left in your isolated bubble of sadness feeling like you don't fit in. Which I've, which I've again, not saying this in defense, no. just saying this as, as observation, and it's just yeah. interesting to have me as like a case study. Yeah. I've compensated significantly. Yeah. And so you wouldn't think that about me. For sure. Like I'm, 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 it's very fluid to connect with almost anybody. Yeah. And then it's interesting that at the root of that, there, I, I, I believe that is actually like a, a compensatory pattern, a capacity to be able to connect fluidly while there's still actually contraction and kind of disease yeah. deeper down. Yeah. So everybody develops their compensation patterns. It's like a process of adaptation, right? Yeah. So the woman that feels she doesn't have worth, particularly for a female, yeah. one of the adaptations, the coping strategies tends to be, I have to be attractive, sexy, right. beautiful, right? For the guy, the quintessential, strong, the performer, the breadwinner, yeah. right? So yeah, for no doubt, the guy that feels like he doesn't fit in, that he is less than, is gonna do everything he can to compensate for that. Yeah. So you become, you know, quite the guy to be around. You're like a good conversationalist. You a very approachable, whatever it might be, whatever ways that you learn as an adaptation. So the irony is you actually have that, but now from an authentic place. Right, it's different. Very different. Yeah. It's an entirely different you. It loses the effort. It loses the underlying fear. And as we started this whole conversation, there's no judgment in that. Right. Because whether someone embraces you, loves you, wants to get your number and wants to talk to you or not, you never are the boy who's less than and left out. It's just someone didn't want to talk to me. Okay, cool. I'll go to the next person. <laughs> but you see, that's that grace. That's why I wanted you to expand on it. It's fluid, right? Yeah. 
There's no resistance. You're not finding anything. You, it's like water finding its track through the rocks and the shrubs and the trees down a hill like that. It's not like, well, fuck it. I'm not going to go down this hill. I got stopped by a rock. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll no, just meander around effortlessly. But it's very confusing, I think, to live in a culture where people are so brilliantly compensated and yeah. masked because the people oftentimes that seem to be doing quote unquote the best yeah. oftentimes are in some way, um, you know, I don't want to say like project like hurting the deepest, but oftentimes that healer, it's yeah. kind of like whatever you think, think the opposite yeah. kind of thing. And not always, not as a law, but it's very confusing the culture that we live in, a lot of peacocking. And it's becoming even more what I'd say insidious because it's even more subtle because as we adapt as a species, our mechanisms, our coping strategies become even more refined, Yeah, correct. you know? Um, so you've done a great job like anybody else. Like you could literally feel, meet someone who has what seems like an air of confidence. Like, wow, that guy's impressive. He's got his own business, beautiful family. But underneath it's all a coping strategy for the fact that he thinks he's not good enough. Which is fascinating, like, you know. And they're going to subconsciously seek out shame-based behavior to reaffirm that, that belief system. So now we come to, I'm addicted to nicotine. Yeah. No, you're not. Certainly no more. You may still sometimes enjoy the experience of nicotine. My assertion, without knowing, without going into the future, is that will start to dissipate quite rapidly mm. because it was never a problem. It's just what you're doing. But as someone as who I know, going back to our very first conversation about wanting, that wanting was based in aversion and reaction. I want relief, but I don't actually want to do that because I know it's bad for me. That's a reactive wanting. But what you really want is freedom, is peace, is grace, is harmony, is union, is intimacy, ironically with yourself. And then that becomes the precursor to finding it with others. And that is the experience of bliss, of joy. There's nothing to escape there that's heaven on earth. Yeah. So then why would I need nicotine? If I want to try it once in a while just for fun, fine, but probably not going to do it for long because it's like that doesn't actually feel good. That takes me out of the ultimate addiction, which is to my true nature. Yeah. That's beautiful. That's cool. Isn't that? Thank you so much. Dude, I had no idea we were going to do that, but that's fun. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> How do you feel as someone who's so tapped into their body in the absence of feeling you're bad or less than, how would you feel in your body? Uh, right now I feel kind of quite significantly in like kind of a, a bit of like a trance type yeah. type state, uh, which is, which is great. And so I'm feeling, um, kind of like a percolating up in the top of my head and kind of like a spaciousness type sensation, like electrical feeling through here. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just kind of simmering. Yeah. But yeah, there's a lot of like movement up in here, which is very nice. Yeah. I would assert that's like an opening of channels. Like when we have judgment, it's a resistant energy. It's a contracting energy. There's a tightness. Yeah. So usually people say they feel lighter. They feel a tingling because there's actually life force coming back into the physicality. Like your physiology is now allowing. There's not, you're not blocking anything. Yeah. You're not fighting yourself. And it's like, oh, I just, I don't know, like use the word fluidity, right? Yeah. Like that feeling of like grace. And that's where, and then, and then we, we really can wrap up because sure. it's important yeah. to, for you in particular to eat, I'll be fine. Yeah. Um, but uh, something that I think is interesting just to stew on is the way that mental, emotional stress manifests itself physically. Yeah. And, and so I'm much, sure. yeah. yeah. And so what are your thoughts about that? Well, they're inextricably connected, right? It's a continuum. Like the mind-body connection is really just different forms of density, right? So the programming that elicits through the interaction of like our emotional state, like the bridge, the mind to me is like the bridge between the soul and the body. And in between the mind and the body is the feelings. That sort of the body is almost like the tapestry against which we can see the mind. Because if we didn't have a way to feel, we wouldn't be able to find the discord, the dysfunction, the disharmony, which is the disease, which manifests. So that's why I said we start externally, oh, you're doing nicotine. No problem. There's literally no problem. Yeah. But the way that you interact with that, the feeling is judgment, criticism, self-loathing. Yeah. Oh, well, where's that coming from? We go back to the deepest programming, which is the subconscious narrative. 
And so, of course, it manifests. Dis-ease is the absence of ease, which manifests eventually, cascades into the physiology and people get sick. So for you, as strong as you are, as built like an ox as you are, as well as you take care of yourself, this programming hasn't really manifested, plus you're young. But over time, checking in 20 years with Aaron, yes. why do I have an autoimmune disorder? Why do I have tics? Like, why do I have some sort of gut issue? Like, subtle. Tits, like man moves. Yes, exactly. <laughs> tics, yeah. flicks, like, you know, like a nervous system is like flinching. And, you know, my athletes that get like the yips and stuff like that. That's that deep internal constraint, fear, trying to avoid some future. So for you now, you get in the absence of it, it's the removal of. That's why I say I don't solve problems, I dissolve them. I know deep down, like I said earlier, I know how the story ends because fundamentally I'm appealing to the spirit that you are. Mm -hmm. But in the way of that light, that love, that freedom, that power was a conversation that was limiting and suffocating you. Yeah. And in that suffering, you found relief in whatever substance. Yeah. So we reverse engineer it. We remove the fundamental code. And I'll ask you again now, is it true that you're bad? Is it true that you're somehow less than others? No. Nope. Great. That was, can you see, somewhat imperatively or inextricably connected to who you thought you were previously, correct? Yeah. Yeah. But in the absence of that, you find the fluidity, you find the grace, you find the freedom, you find the circuitry that's flowing. Yeah. And my guess is from that space, whatever previous addictions you had would certainly minimize and probably absolutely disappear. Yeah, Moshe, Moshe Feldenkrais has a, a term called uh, parasitic tension. Like there's subtle parasites that pull on mm -hmm. our life force ultimately. It yeah. could be tension in the form, well ultimately like the you know, mind body, it's all just one congruent system. Yeah. But those, those subtle contractive forces that we're holding throughout. It could be in our jaw or our hands or yeah. shoulders or a diaphragm or a pelvic floor or feet, whatever. But it's that, that subtle contractive energy acts as a parasite and it just pulls on us throughout the day. Yeah. And, it's, and it becomes interesting when you relate that into a software issue. Yeah. Because ultimately I think it's, a, you know, it could all come back to software for sure. There'd be a way to say that. Yeah. And movement is a path into that and dance and anything that's kind of cathartic is going to be a pathway into that. Anything that's expressive, anything that just taps into authenticity within yourself without yeah. shame yeah. will, will be like a medicine for that. And it's incredibly liberating. We got to do it, man. That's the thing. Self love. That's the thing. Self acceptance. Yeah. Yeah. Now Aaron gets to navigate, move around the world without any constraint. Which, of course, in your realm, that does manifest in the body too, right? Yeah. Over time, the constriction, the constraint, the resistance, the fear, the judgment, they're all contractions. So when people become very stubborn in their attitude or stiff in their physiology, it's usually over time. The dis-ease manifests either as an actual chronic disease or invariably the absence of ease in the way that you navigate life. Yeah, chronic pain or yeah. anxiety, depression, IBS, acne, yeah. fat, you know, excess, excessive any, fat, any whatever problem. thing. It's just like all I'm just holding. Yeah. And it's it's tough because it usually manifests over time. And so to be able to make that correlation you know, and see, wow, like the cancer, the fibromyalgia, the Alzheimer's, the Parkinson's, the IBS, the Crohn's, whatever, it wasn't like right there, but living in a form of suffering, constraint, dis-ease, the absence of fluidity has over time cascaded through every cell in my body and it's manifested as a sickness, disease. And that's the, as I said, the tapestry of the body shows, displays the constraints, the limitations, the adequacies of the identity. And every time. day you're just reaffirming, as long as you're running that operating system and yeah. you're building up the physiological, mental, emotional, yeah. slash environmental in the form of your relationships, your work, et cetera, feedback, it just confirms that topical symptomatic layer of yourself that isn't actually inherently true because ultimately below that we're all liberated, authentic, light, expressive love. light beings or and, whatever. And to go full circle to how we started, that is the one thing that we can rely on humans to do is to fulfill on their ultimate code, even if it is at their own demise. Because hmm. you get to be right about your own inadequacies, insecurities and limitations. Hmm. But hopefully a conversation like this will bust a few people out of it. And then they'll get to be right about the ultimate form of self-knowing, which is... I'm free, I'm love, 
I'm pure possibility. Uh oh. So it is. <laughs> <laughs> if you're so, into that kind of shit, really which we are. Yeah, totally, totally, totally the way. Um, where can people go from here? If they want to go deeper into your stuff. And your um, stuff oh, my whatever, channels whatever are just uh, Instagram uh, at Peter Crone and then website petercrone.com. That's about it. Perfect. Yeah. Should we, anything else? I mean, I feel like, I feel like we're good. I think, Dude. I mean, I feel good. I think you nailed it. I, I, I cried a couple of times, so I, I did my part. Yeah. You know? I appreciate that. That makes me look <laughs> yeah. good, which yeah. reinforces my deep seated <laughs> really, fears that no really. one loves me and yeah. that I'm not doing a good job. <laughs> yeah. Well, next, next time maybe we can, my, I had intention of going into that direction of like what's in there. Yeah. Um, but next time, thanks for going in here. Thank I, you for allowing me to poke around. Program a little bit. <laughs> all right, that is it. That is all. Thank you all for tuning in. I'll see you next week. Hope you guys enjoyed that conversation. Jump over to the Align Podcast YouTube page to watch the video version of this. It is in Peter's absolutely stunning home in Lake Tahoe. The view is incredible and uh, it's just amazing. So I highly recommend jumping over, checking that out. Rewatch this episode, take some notes, share it with your friends, share it with your family, anybody that uh, you care about. I think this would be a supportive conversation for them. That's my opinion. Um, you can choose for yourself and I uh, just appreciate you guys so much. Thanks for subscribing. Thanks for reviews. Thanks for joining you. I'll see you next week.